What's going on, everyone? It's time for another edition of Strictly Business with Eric Bischoff, presented to you by the Ad Free Shows Network and Podcast Heat. I am John Alba. I'm the co-host of Strictly Business. But if I'm the co-host, that means there's a star. His name is Mr. Eric Bischoff. Come on, give him the wave. You know, everyone loves seeing the way. There it is. What's going on, my man? It was so great seeing you last week at WrestleCade. Good to be back in the saddle again with you here on Strictly Business. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a fun weekend. Shout out to Maureen, who yes. set it all up for us, or for me over at Ad Free Shows, and uh, all the fans that turned out. It was great. Had a great time. Really enjoyed it. And uh, but man, it was cold there. I mean, I left Minnesota thinking I was visiting my brother and sister over the Thanksgiving break. And I left from Minneapolis going to Winston-Salem. And I think, oh, man, I don't need a jacket. I'm going down south. <laughs> it's colder there than it was in Minnesota. Yeah. It it was really cold. But I'll tell you, man, that was such a great convention. WrestleCade is genuinely one of my favorite conventions that we get a chance to be a part of every year. Tracy Myers, who we had on this podcast last year, uh, they do such an awesome job with it. And those fans are great wrestling fans that come out there. Uh, to that area and we did get the news this week by the way eric that sting's last match is going to be at the greensboro coliseum and in north carolina for aw revolution obviously so much wcw history there rick is a big part of that as well you got any thoughts on that uh, it's a great choice great great choice full circle kind of going back to sting's roots in his beginning so i i like the choice it's a great choice for a venue i'm sure it's going to be a great event yeah, great wrestling fans in North Carolina. Thanks to everyone who came out to WrestleCade to support Eric. Uh, we did a live show for the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. That was awesome. So thank you to everyone who supported the Ad Free Shows family for that. We are live on Ad Free Shows, Eric. Speaking of which, we got Lucas here in the crowd. We got Josh Henney in the crowd. We got Adam Jefferson. We got Darren. It's a full house, man. Want to give a shout out to our Ad Free Shows fans here? absolutely glad to see everybody here lucas i think this may be the first time i i've seen your name pop up if you've been here before and i didn't see your name my apologies but uh you jumped out man i said hey lucas this may be a first so whether it is or isn't welcome to everybody we got anthony in here as well so thank you to everyone who joins in you can ask questions to eric as part of your ad free shows perk if you've got any coming on we were supposed to do an ask eric episode last week unfortunately due to the travel restrictions uh, things just got a little out of hand so we will get that to you hopefully next week uh we got so many great questions to answer for that eric but we have a lot to talk about today uh, something big happened in the wrestling world this past week but before we can get to that, I know a there were a lot was, of things happened in the oh, wrestling world this past week. But I, before we could get to any of that, maybe involving one Bill Phil and the Raw TV rights, there was something I know you texted me about this and you were like, we gotta talk about this. No, this is this business. is a massive this has massive implications for sports entertainment, the business of the business. I, I when I, I read the headline, I it jumped out at me and I went, wow. This is either one of those wrestling versions of a conspiracy theory where everything is a work or, or is the pinnacle of the tried and true wrestling formula where the rub means everything. The rub where one plus one equals three. This is big news, big, big news. And, and, and proves once again that professional wrestling is on the cutting edge of not only sports entertainment, but sports and entertainment. Take it away. So Paige Van Zandt, MMA star, you may have seen her on AEW television in the past couple of years as well. Uh, she's one of the bigger names out there in the combat sports industry. She's got a hot take, Eric. She says that she believes the Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey quote unquote love story is 100% fake. She said that on her podcast with her husband, Austin Vanderford. She's saying it's a work. She's saying it's a work. She said, it's well, a come for me. she said, come for me, Swifties. I have UFC fans coming for me. I think I can handle the Swifties. It is publicity. It is one. It's huge for the NFL because yes, the NFL is big. Taylor Swift is huge. And now she's getting an entirely different demographic to come watch the NFL. She added, think of the wives that are buying Travis Kelsey jerseys. Now it's a huge publicity play on both fronts. It's good for Taylor Swift. It's good for the NFL. It's good for Travis Kelsey. There's so much strategic stuff 
happening. Now, Eric, you are the king of strategy. Are you buying the Travis Kelsey Taylor Swift relationship as a shoot or as a work? And I don't know because there's a lot of money involved. And you know, had Paige not gone into kind of the the, the comments about think of all the Travis jerseys that are now being sold by wives of of NFL fans, that kind of makes sense to me, dude. <laughs> it it makes sense. I mean, it could be true. And wouldn't that be fascinating if it was all of this attention that the media is sports media is dumping on Travis and Taylor and, and all of the drama and, and the cutaways and seeing Taylor Swift up in the box and cheering Travis on. And I don't know, man, I, I, I'm leaning into it. I think Paige might be onto something. Oh. I don't know, man. I think I think they're legit. I really do. I think that this do you know the backstory, Eric, of how this relationship came to be in the first place? <laughs> no, I no. don't. So so this is the definition of shooting your shot. And that's why I love it. Because it's a great it's life. Moonshot. Taylor Swift is a moonshot. So so ready for this? So here's how this happened. So Travis Kelsey. Again, very famous professional football player. And in my opinion, a lot more famous a... now, isn't he? Oh, yes, he is. Uh -huh. but in, in my opinion, he will be a very successful crossover guy once his playing career is done, too, like how Gronk is. Um, he went to a Taylor Swift concert, and Taylor Swift fans exchange friendship bracelets. And that's you go to a concert, you exchange a bracelet, it has your name on it. It's that's it's so a, cute. That's it's, very cute. It's adorable, right? So Travis Kelsey wanted to use his celebrity to give Taylor Swift a custom friendship bracelet that he had made for her. Oh, now, so now, he said that the friendship bracelet had his number on it. As brother asked, what number? Are you talking about 87, the one you wear on your back? Or are you talking about a different phone number or a different number, your phone number? And he said, you know which number I'm talking about. So he didn't Travis he didn't, got game, man. Oh, he got game on the field. He's got game off yeah. the field. So he didn't get to meet her because apparently before her concerts, because she does a three hour show that's very intense, she doesn't really like to talk to people beforehand to keep her voice fresh. So he put that story out into the ether and was just kind of like, eh, oh well, what are you gonna do? Right? Taylor Swift's people heard the story and they connected them. She got his number. And it started going back and forth. The next thing you know, three weeks later, she's sitting in a family suite with the rest of the Kelsey family cheering him on, getting all excited over him scoring a touchdown. And the fans get to see them out there in the box. The uh, reporter caught video of them walking out together. And it's been a love story ever since. It's a lot more deep than that. I don't want to. A year from now, to... she'll be cutting a song talking about what an ass he is. <laughs> That's the downside. There's a lot of upside. You know, what an exciting dating experience. Taylor Swift, all the energy and the limelight and the focus and the attention and everything that comes with dating a megastar like Taylor yeah. Swift. But the downside is her track record, not so good. And mm. if you end up on the wrong side of her, she's going to write a shitty song about oh, you. You're going to get an album written about you. That's that's what's going to happen to you. And those Swifties are very, very, very loyal fans. There's no you question. Better be good to her. They absolutely. have a bunch of 14-year-old girls hounding him down and wanting <laughs> to kick his NFL ass. But it's kind of cool, though, right? Like he shot his shot. He knew what he wanted and went out there and put it into the universe. He's like the Tony Robbins of the NFL, man. He manifests <laughs> this stuff. Exactly. Manifestation. So that's why I'm choosing to believe in it. I want to believe in a good story out there. I, I have faith that this could be a real thing, but you're not wrong, Eric. There's a lot of publicity that comes from it. I can't believe the NFL isn't branding Taylor Swift jerseys yet. Isn't that amazing? It's not over yet. Yeah, it's, it's not true. over what? Let's, let's see how the season turns out. Mm. Because here's the downside. She could be like, who was that other uh, singer a long time ago dated a Dallas Cowboys quarterback, Tony Romo? Oh, Jessica Simpson? Yeah, look what it did mm -hmm. for him, man. It cratered his mm -hmm. career. He just <laughs> he just ended up in the sewage after that. I mean, he's like 
the number one color commentator in all the NFL on TV. Yeah, but he's not playing football. He, she ruined him. <laughs> women weak in legs, Rocky. Women weak in legs. Anthony's buying your conspiracy. He says every time they're captured on camera phone, Travis looks directly into it. Mm. Oh, he's working it, brother. He's working it. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, look, Paige Van Zandt's a smart, smart girl. She knows what's She's going on. Too. <laughs> she got it together. I heard she has an OnlyFans. I haven't checked it out, but rumor she has, has it. She's got she has a very fans. successful OnlyFans, as a matter of fact. She she dabbled a little bit into AEW doing the Dan Lambert stuff. And uh, I'm curious to see if she ever dabbles back into wrestling because those UFC stars, man, their crossover record, all things considered, is pretty damn successful. Just time, time will tell. Time, time will, tell. will, in fact, she's a woman tell. of many talents. Hey, hey, Ronda Rousey showed up in AEW recently, so you never know. Yeah, that, was gonna... that was weird. That was <laughs> weird. Why do you think that's weird? I just, it's, it's just weird to me. It's just weird. Why would you, why would she do that? What's the motivation? She doesn't need the money. I, I just don't understand the motivation. Is she trying to prove that she actually loves professional wrestling, that she actually has it in her quote unquote blood? Or is it just a stunt to get it some attention and maybe get back into a conversation with WWE? I don't know. I don't know the lady. Very impressed with her. I mean, mm -hmm. her career in judo speaks for itself. She did very well. And UFC up until she the time she didn't, Holly Holm just rocked her. She was never the same after that. She got her bell rung and that was it. She cashed in her chips and left the building. Honestly, I think she just wanted to do something fun. She got to work with Marina Shafir, who's her best friend. Oh, well, she, that makes sense. Yeah, she she did the indie appearance too with Pro Wrestling Revolver working with Marina. So. I think she just wanted to do something fun, maybe try the industry out outside of the confines of WWE. Because, look, as we know, Eric, WWE, there's a very specific structure in how you do things. So maybe she wanted to try it out, try something different. And never a bad thing as far as I see it. Hopefully, uh, do you think we've seen the last of her in wrestling? In any meaningful way, yeah. I mean, she may pop up like she did recently with Ring of Honor or on the independent scene or whatever, but I don't. I don't see her making another big career comeback. I just don't. Would you say her run was successful? Define success financially? Sure. I'm sure it was financially successful for her. I, I mean, to me, and again, this is going to sound like I've got, you know, something against Ronda, and I certainly don't. I admire her greatly. Um, but I never felt like she was passionate about it. I think it was a career move for her. I think it was a great financial move for her, but I never got the feeling that she was in it. She was visiting from day one, but there's, there is an argument. I think Conrad Thompson brought it up. Perhaps you did a couple of weeks ago. We're talking about Rhonda and Rhonda was cast right out of the shoot as a baby face. She's not a baby face. If you go back and you you listen to some of her interviews or read some of the interviews that she did following her loss to Holly Holmes, she was kind of, she didn't take it well. I think she's a heel at heart. And when you cast a heel at heart, especially someone who isn't really trained as a performer, she hasn't really developed a character. She's developed her skill as a fighter. She probably turned up, you know, the the level of her aggressiveness and the way she came to the ring. She always had this stern look on her face, which I always got a kick out of because she looks like she's 12. You know, I mean, she's li literally a, physiologically a baby face, but she'd come and she'd be scowling and her chin would be sticking out. And she's trying to look all tough and intimidating. And it always made me chuckle. Of course, I wasn't the woman on the other side of the cage with her having to fight her either. But um, perhaps if she would have been positioned as a heel when she made her debut the outcome of her run may have been much different but when you take somebody with little to no real performance experience other than her athletic background and you cast them in a role that requires some level of acting and character development um 
you're much better off sticking to someone's core personality traits as opposed to going, ah, I know you're, you know, you're kind of a heel by nature, but we want you to be a baby face. That's it's hard to be a baby face. It's a lot harder to be a baby face than it is to be a heel. It's treacherous, treacherous water. That baby face water. That's treacherous shit. So who knows? Yeah, she had that amazing WrestleMania debut. And it worked well as a baby face in that particular match. But after that, I think if they had gone more in a heel direction, you would have seen more sustained crowd involvement with her path. But I, I don't think you can take it away from her, man. Like, I don't think those women would have main evented WrestleMania 35 the first time women were in the main event of WrestleMania without Ronda Rousey's star power. You know, now, thankfully, it's it's a mediated thing where it's not unusual to see a woman in the main event. But they were the first, and I think Ronda was the big reason for that, that allowed Becky Lynch and Charlotte to be able to elevate their respective games in, in an even larger limelight. I think she does deserve some credit there. Oh, no, I'm not taking anything away from her. I just think perhaps she was miscast, and perhaps she may have not totally been in to the babyface role, which perhaps is one of the reasons why I just never felt connected to her. Sure. Well, let's talk about someone who is a natural baby face at heart in life. CM Punk, Phil Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Bischoff, one of the wildest turn of events that we've seen in some time in wrestling went down this past week at Survivor Series, where CM Punk made his shocking return to WWE after nearly 10 years away a couple months off being let go by AEW. I texted you right away, and I just said, how about that? <laughs> this was something that we can dive into pretty deeply here and how things came about, the element of surprise, the moment itself, the fallout of it. But I have to ask you off the bat, your initial reaction to it. I was pissed. Because like two weeks before, I made another dumbass bet with Conrad on 83 weeks because Conrad said, I believe we're going to see CM Punk back in WWE before the end of the year. And I said, I don't think so. It doesn't make sense to me. They don't need him right now. The Survivor Series is sold out. It's already getting a ton of buzz. Where is the added value? Now, this is not my opinion of CM Punk, the performer, or Phil Brooks, the individual. Like, make clear every time I talk about him, I don't know him, the individual. Never had a conversation with him. Don't know what he's like beyond what we see and hear about publicly. But just because WWE is so freaking hot right now that there is no hole in their roster, there's not a need you know, it's not like an NFL team that needs an, a better offensive line and we've got to find that one guy who can be our anchor, right? There was no holes. So it was like if you're going to pull that trigger and bringing in a, bring in a guy who is as controversial as Punk is and who has done a great job of keeping himself front and center in terms of controversy, um, why would you use it on a night when you don't need it. Now, Conrad, on the other hand, his position was mm, they're negotiating for TV rights for Raw, and perhaps that added level of chatter or internet wrestling buzz and reaction to Punk coming in, maybe that would be enough to push a deal over the top if there was one on the table. I still didn't think that it would happen, especially at Survivor Series. So I bet Conrad, once again, Conrad was very quick to seize the opportunity and say, well, if you're so sure of yourself, why don't you bet me? I bet that he's going to be there. You say he isn't. If I'm right, you shave your head. Again! <laughs> and I didn't even think about it. I just said, sure, because I was convinced yeah. it wasn't going to happen. It made no sense to me. Timing-wise, it just didn't make sense, timing-wise. 
So my in initial reaction was, <laughs> here we go again. I get to sit in the middle of the ring somewhere, probably a Top Guy weekend in January, and get my head shaved once again. And I'm, I'm getting tired of it. Tired of it. I mean, you know your hair grows back quickly at it's least. It's not the point. It's the yeah. embarrassment. Sitting mm -hmm. in that chair with people all around you at ringside, cheering mm -hmm. it on, hoping to be one of the people that get up there and embarrass me publicly once again. I don't know, man. This is the last time I make that bet. Yeah, you, you probably come should. come up with a different bet. You probably should come up with something. Again, wager dinner. Wager there's there's so many things that you could wager here that's not your hair but nonetheless eric this deal did come together very quickly and very privately even according to paul Levesque himself uh, he said very few people knew about it the reports sean rossap and mike johnson have been all over this story uh that essentially a conversation between punk and wwe was had within the week prior to survivor series it was positive they spoke for a couple of hours and then the day of the show, the deal came together and he was brought in. He was sequestered in about 20 minutes before the end of the show. The people in the main event, the wrestlers in the main event were told about this just as they were about to go through the curtain that CM Punk would be returning after the match. Uh, Paul Levesque was said to have taken over Gorilla himself and produced the entire ending of the show. And as we saw, Punk came back to a big surprise response with people going absolutely nuts now he insinuated eric that him and nick khan were the two that primarily knew i would imagine at least a couple production people knew but and, aside and, from and, that, and, and, and probably a few attorneys and yes a few attorneys as well uh, but aside from that the ability to pull off a surprise like that in today's stage and general wrestling environment is unbelievable as far as i see it what do you think of the execution of the moment in and of itself. I'm going to make a quick shout out here to a friend of mine by the name of Ryan McGrath, who I hope is listening because a while back I wrote a book called controversy creates cash. Mm -hmm. And in that book, I talked about Sarsa story, anticipation, reality, surprise and action the five elements that in my opinion if a storyline has all five of those elements you're printing money if a storyline has four out of the five elements it's going to be successful three out of five eh. two out of five it's a flop and that formula has proven true time and time and time again in all forms of business, not just the wrestling business. If you have a product and your product comes with a great story behind it and you create anticipation for that product or service, and in this case, the reality of CM and let's let's back up. The story is there. Story, anticipation, reality, surprise, and action. It's what makes the freaking world go round. CM Punk showing up in WWE. Clearly, there's what a decade's worth of story there. Yep. His role in WWE, the way he left, the pipe bomb promo, which by the way, I found out subsequently was actually written for him. Um but the story is there. There's been this anticipation that's been brewing since the minute he left, he meaning punk left AEW. Oh, is he going to come back? Yes, he is. No, he isn't. I bet he is. I bet he isn't. I'll shave my head if I'm wrong. Uh, the anticipation has been there almost instantly. It didn't have to be created or manufactured. The reality is the authenticity of it all. Meaning all of this stuff that we've been reading about for 18 months with regard to punk and AEW and the drama with the elite, and the press conference and all oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. that's all real. 
That isn't a storyline. These are all things that happened. It's authentic. It's not a manufactured story. So you've got great story, history, backstory. You've got anticipation that was built in <clears throat> from the moment the news broke that Punk was being let go. The authenticity can't be doubted. The surprise was pulled off perfectly. And now we have action coming up next. That's the easy part with wrestling. The action is the easy part. The story is the hard part. Creating anticipation is a challenge. Keeping it real and authentic is also a big challenge, especially in the world of, of professional wrestling. Surprises, as you pointed out, are few and far between. Authentic ones, ones that really catch people by surprise, and you get the response that you, you hope for, which clearly happened at Survivor Series. And all that's left now is, you know, where does he go? What's the action look like? And I don't think there's any question we're going to see great action especially because there's great story and there's anticipation. There's a lot of anticipation for who he's going to work with and what that storyline is going to look like. So in terms of the Sarsa formula, I think Punk coming in <clears throat> at Survivor Series knocked it completely out of the park, which indicates to me this is going to be a very, very successful, long-term financially successful decision, provided that the wheels don't fall off because of personal issues. And as I said before, when, when the subject of Punk going back to WWE came up and I was asked, well, do you think he'd work there? I mean, do you think it would work with CM Punk being in WWE compared to what we just saw happen in AEW? And I think my response was something to the effect of, I'm going to paraphrase myself, but I think he'd get along fine in AEW because he's not going to be able to get away with the same kind of things in WWE that he was able to get into get into because of just the lack of leadership and structure and maturity um, that exists in AEW. And that's not really a knock. I know it sounds like one, but it's a new company with a guy that's never run a wrestling business. He was a fan, but that doesn't count. I'm a fan of the Rolling Stones, but I couldn't jump up on stage and do a set with them. Just because you're a fan of something doesn't mean you're good at it. But I think because it's a new company with a guy who is, although a wrestling fan, has no experience in, in running a wrestling company for sure or dealing with the types of personalities that exist in that world, um, there's going to be growing pains. He, he, Tony Khan is going to learn on the job just like I did, and he's going to make mistakes, and there's going to be a lack of structure <clears throat> and a lack of maturity, just like there was when I took over WCW because I didn't have any experience either in that regard. So I'm pretty sure Punk is going to, provided he wants to, motivation is at the core of this, right? If, if Punk woke up and said, look, I, I want to have one, one more really, really good run. And if he's willing to be a team player, I think he's going to be very successful in WWE. He's just not going to be able to get away with the same kind of silliness, nor will he be exposed mm -hmm. to the same kind of backstage environment that he was exposed to in, in, in AEW. He's going to have to learn to deal with a more corporate, structured environment. And if he's willing, if his intentions are, are such that he really wants to make this work and be a team player, I think his second run will be better than his first in, in WWE. Yeah, structure is, I think, the big buzzword there because structure is what will keep things in place. I think this is going to work as well, and I want to hit on a few things that you said. Um, Sean Ross Sapp did report that there had been talk that there was a behavioral clause in Punk's contract coming in here, which seems to indicate WWE trying to cover its tracks here with Punk. I think Eric Punk probably carries a little more respect towards some of the individuals in WWE as far as performers go, because I think in AEW, he came in there and he viewed his role as being the guy to lead the ship and his mentorship and his tutelage would help bring others to that next level. In WWE, that's not a role for him here. He's surrounded by, and I, I wrote this out before Punk even returned that night. There are nine to 12 people right now in WWE, men and women, 
who you could look at at any given moment and put in the main event as top people. Uh, they, they are top stars. And there is going to be a level of respect that is commanded with that alone where you don't reserve the right to tell them what they should be doing or how to do it because they have made it. And I think that's where Punk's role now fits, where he's now integrated into that fold. He's one of those people. And listen, he's not a stupid guy. I think he recognizes that his perception with everything that happened in AEW was damaged. And I think finishing out his career with a successful run here in WWE and being able to cement the legacy in a positive manner where people look back at him as a performer rather than a personality, I think that means a lot to him. And we'll see how that all unravels here in the next few months. Did you have any thoughts on his presentation after the Monday Night Raw promo and how they might be plotting things forward for him here? I didn't get a chance to see Monday okay. Night Raw. I was out of town and, and uh, with family and wrapping up our Thanksgiving week in Minneapolis. So I didn't get a chance to see So, it. So the promo was very much, I'm, I'm happy to be here. He called, he said that he's finally, he's home. And, you know, a lot of people saw that and they're like, come on. Like, are you kidding me? After everything that's happened, you're saying you're home and you're finally yourself and everything. My thought, Eric, is that this character that they're going to take in a direction is going to be that he's essentially full of shit and that deep down he is not here to make friends. He's here to make money and that he is simply CM Punk at his core, very aware of his own greed. And uh, I mean, Seth Rollins has been out there calling him a hypocrite. And I think they're going to play into all of that stuff going forward here. Uh, yeah. And that's the beauty. <clears throat> that is the beauty of it is that because of the history, and this is, again, controversy creates cash. My God, if there's ever a reprint of controversy creates cash, I'm going to ask WWE if like, we can license the image of CM Punk because I don't think there's anybody that can better define or represent the, the, the phrase controversy creates cash than CM Punk. Going back to walking out with WWE and everything that's happened since. So yeah, I look. Let's. I, I'm. Look. I know I've been hard on him, and I, I. I still believe everything that I've said. I'm not going back on anything. I think what Punk did with Tony Khan in that press conference was, in my opinion, so unprofessional that it borders, you know, being unforgivable. I would never put someone in that position again, and I. I doubt WWE will put him in that position. But there's no denying that he's got value. He's on the top of mind with wrestling fans. He's in the conversation across the boards with wrestling fans, good, bad, or indifferent. And he's been able to maintain that for quite a long time. So I'm, I'm look, a lot of the stuff punk said when he first got to AEW to me showed his ass, you know, coming out and cutting a promo on Hulk Hogan to try to get, try to get a reaction from the internet wrestling community to me showed a level of immaturity and lack of understanding. It's not how you get yourself over. You'll get a reaction. It's cheap heat. It's like walking out and, you know, criticizing, you know, you're in a venue, you're in a live event, you criticize the hometown team. It's easy to do that. It's not talent. It's not creativity. It's cheap heat. And then some of the comments that Punk made when he first arrived, that him showing up along with a couple others was – the equivalent of Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and is going to have the same impact impact as the NWO. That was fucking stupid and clearly stupid given what we've seen happen. And I called it out the minute he said it, but look, different time, different place, different opportunity. And perhaps I'm looking at the bright side, perhaps punk meant that maybe this is not a work and a setup. For his character go maybe he did maybe punk realized after everything that he's been through that wwe is not as bad a place as he made it out to be Couldn't and, be. and and he is home so we'll see Couldn't let's be. give him the i'm gonna give him the benefit of yeah look i, I hope know a lot of wrestling out, fans are. there are a lot of great matches on the table with him and great stories to be told i mean i said this immediately i said i see no reason eric why wwe shouldn't throw every bit of money they have at trying to make Stone Cold Steve Austin versus CM Punk happened. That was one of the last Ooh. true marquee matches that has been on the table for the past 15 years that so many fans clamored for. WWE teased it multiple times, but Austin wasn't in a place where he could work. 
Two years ago, we saw him come back. Last year, they tried to get him to work again, but creatively, he said he didn't see it. There's an opportunity here, and Fightful reported this week that there are people in WWE who are optimistic about a match like that happening, and there's no denying that's a huge marquee match. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be optimistic as well because I love watching Steve. I love his character. He's just an amazing performer and such, he's got such a great legacy. I would love to see it. You know, I question whether Steve's in a place physically where he wants to get in there and bounce around. Steve is also the kind of guy that doesn't want to go out there and be less than what people remember him being. And it's one thing to go out in a WrestleMania moment for a spot. That's not a match. You know, I could see Steve getting involved physically, but a match, a 12 or 15 or 18 minute match that requires give and take. I hope Steve's physically in a place where he feels confident he wants to do that because that would be amazing. But it's been a minute for Steve. So I don't know. Well, hey, I hope it happens. I, I, I mean, hope look, it happens. You go out and you work a match that's basically a brawl. That's essentially what Steve did for the latter half of his career. We saw that in the Kevin Owens match. You don't even have to take any bumps if you don't want to. You just go out there and have a fight. I, for me, Eric, man. Yeah, but, pro- but Steve, look, let's, fantasy booking, I agree with you, John. But. I was one of the last matches that Steve had. Hell yeah. Yeah. And you basically retired him. Well, okay. (laughs) But, but without saying too much, Steve was in no position at that point in time Mm. to take any kind of a bump. Oh yeah. He said that or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my point. If he's been able to overcome, because you know, it was a neck injury. That's a serious injury. You're talking about centimeters of of some you know something going wrong, a bump, you know, turning your head too hard, too fast, one direction, whatever. Little things can have significant adverse outcomes. So let's just see. I I'll pray for Steve's now yeah. ability to do it because I think it would be so much fun to watch. Just the it feud itself, the, the feud, the program would be great. I'm sorry. So. The program would be great. Would be awesome. So let's see what happens. I'm I'm optimistic. I think it would be a hell of a, a, a gift for wrestling fans out there to get one of the last true dream matches that actually exists. And that is a dream match. Oh, I know we God. throw. Now you just ruined it for me, calling it a fucking dream match. <laughs> but it is, though. Like, that is. And I'm not devaluing it, Eric. I'm saying that is a legitimate dream no, match. I, I, That's... I, I know, I know. I'm not, I'm, I'm just, ugh, I just hate that phrase. Hey, but well, speaking of dream matches, how do you think Tony Khan took all this? I mean, he, he can't have not expected it, right? Like, it, the moment that he let Punk go was always going to be a possibility that it was going to happen. Yeah, but I mean, look, it's Cody, it's Jade, now it's Punk. Yeah, I mean, it's significant. And and that does ugh. relate to AEW because it does say, hey, here were these people, especially as far as Cody and Punk go, Eric. These are people who went to AEW because they wanted to start a movement. They wanted something different than the establishment. And now they're back in the establishment. Grass is always greener. Eh, it's not. <laughs> but that's not to say that it it's not a place that works out well for people. It certainly does. But. Now AEW has this perception where people who came there are seriously entertaining going back to where their original problems started. I think that's something that AEW has to tackle head on. I really do. Well, and I think it's it all it comes back to the same thing that I've been banging my drum about for over two years, where everybody decided, oh, he's an old man screaming at the clouds, he's a hater, and Tony won't give me a job, blah, blah, none of which is true. But it's going to come down to story and getting characters over and coming up with something other than dream matches of a 14 year old wrestling fans wet dream, because that ain't it. I mean, I read online, I mean, you probably know more about this if it's even true, but my understanding is that Matt Hardy's come out and had some criticism of AEW booking. 
We've heard recently, and I'm only talking about things that I've read and heard publicly. I'm not sharing any inside information. I don't do that. I don't share private conversations that I've had with people. I don't do that either. Um, but there are people who are on that roster currently in AEW that are coming out. And Britt Baker just came out. Critical of lack of interview time. When your top talent starts coming out and expressing those views publicly, that's a really bad sign. That's like waking up in the morning with a cyst in the middle of your forehead. You know, you, you, you can't just pretend that's not happening. You, you, you've got to address it. And I think what Tony needs to do, as I've been saying for two years now, story character development, because the rest of this nonsense isn't working. It's just not. Yeah. And as far as Matt's comments are concerned, you can hear that on this week's Extreme Life of Matt Hardy available right here on adfreeshows.com. A lot of what Matt talked about was basing booking around character and story and being a more open minded to different forms of presentation with wrestling. And I think there were definitely things that he brought up that were valid. It wasn't a bitching and moaning fest, but it was just offering constructive ways in which storytelling could be improved and more people being given opportunities i think there are some things storytelling wise that aw is doing very well right now uh, mariah may i'm so high on how they've introduced her character i think it's been very effective the christian and adam copeland stuff has been very entertaining That's been, that seems to be clicking and, and working mm -hmm. very entertaining so i'm curious to see if we start leaning more into that stuff with them but all things considered as far as the punk stuff with tony he he had to have expected it at some point i think all of us eric at some point expected punk to be back in wwe it was just a matter of when and how and i think all of the planets aligned i mean paul levesque kind of even said as much all the planets just kind of aligned here where he's in charge now nick khan's in charge vince is kind of out of the equation he's the one that punk had all the heat with and now he has this opportunity to go finish his career on the right foot and i hope that is what happens here because that would be quite the gift for wrestling fans around the world. And Eric, we've got a gift for wrestling fans around the world as well with our friends over at Manscaped. I've got a proclamation. Ready? This is from the people at Manscaped. Ready? This is what they want me to tell you. Everyone listening to Strictly Business. Merry Ballsmas. That's what they want to wish you. Happy Thanksgiving as well. The holidays are approaching, but what if I told you that you had the celebrations starting early this year. It turns out the perfect gift does in fact exist, Eric. And who else to bring it down your chimney than the leaders and below the waist grooming? Keep calm and let your balls jingle this season with Manscaped's brand new performance package 5.0 Ultra featuring the new lawnmower 5.0. Watch all your wishes and mistletoe kisses come true. Look nice when you're doing naughty things by going to manscaped.com and use code wrestlebiz for 20 percent off plus free shipping unwrap the gift of smoothness this season with manscaped eric we've been we've been all about manscaped here on the strictly business podcast and i see you right there you are sporting one of those hats they gave you look at that yeah honestly it's uh it's my my christmas present from the folks at manscaped because i have everything I have every Manscaped product that they manufacture and distribute. The only thing I didn't have was this cool hat. <laughs> and now I got the cool hat. I'm proud to wear it. Yeah, we're we're super proud to be sponsored by Manscaped here on Strictly Business. The Performance pack of, Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate bundle for the man who deserves it all. Included in this special sack is the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and nose trimmer manscapes liquid formulations and two free gifts starting with santa's number one helper we've got the lawnmower 5.0 ultra this fifth generation trimmer features two next gen blade heads a standard trimmer blade for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go for that smooth finish wherever your heart desires the 5.0 ultra body trimmer and the weed whacker 2.0 nose and ear hair trimmer Feature proprietary advanced skin safe technology to protect your delicate presence. Plus, both 
are waterproof, so there's no issue clearing the snow out of your driveway. And, and that, now that, that, that bad boy's got a headlight on it. <laughs> it's like Rudolph, man. <laughs> now, now that you've groomed the candy cane, it's time to make sure you don't smell like a reindeer with the Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion and Crop Preserver Anti-Shave Ball Deodorant. Once they touch your sack, you will never go back. Plus, you've got the Beard Hedger, which I absolutely love as well. The 4.0 package prior to this, Manscaped is crushing it right now. We want to help you crush it with Manscaped too. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WrestleBiz at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com. Use code WrestleBiz, W-R-E-S-T-L-E-B-I-Z. Manscaped, get your jingle balls ready for the holidays. And they got some of the best copywriters in the industry, don't they? They really do. Because <clears throat> I laugh. Every time I hear a Manscaped read that we do, I laugh. It's fun. It and is. it's a great product, which makes it even more fun. And Manscaped has been with us for a long time. Dude, I love I got the, the folks over at Manscaped. I got the 4.0 right here. I'm awaiting my 5.0 Ultra. Well, why do you have it at your desk? What the Be fuck are you doing with that at your desk? Because I've used it to demonstrate the product on our podcast, not physically demonstrating, but to show people what it looks I was like. Say, what do you? What do you? You got an OnlyFans thing going on? You and <laughs> I'm Paige like Paige Van Zandt, man. man. I'm ready to go here. <laughs> she schooled you how to make money on OnlyFans. Man, you ain't kidding. Those those top creators on OnlyFans are whew, they are bringing it in it's got me rethinking my career path i'll tell you that not that anyone would be paying for any of my content but i i digress here so i want to get back to something you hit on which is really interesting that you said conrad brought up and i totally agree with it too which is punk being brought in for the possibility of trying to improve the TV rights situation with Monday Night Raw and try to add some leverage. Because what we did here was on Monday night, Paul Levesque and Nick Khan were not at Raw because they were out in Los Angeles negotiating television rights for Raw. We know SmackDown is set. That's going back to USA. We know NXT is headed to the CW. So there have been a lot of questions and rumor and innuendo as to where Monday Night Raw is going to land. A lot of people, Eric, think that that announcement is going to come sooner rather than later. I have to source the Wrestling Observer for this because this was their report today. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I'll leave that jurisdiction up to you. But Dave says that, quote, they were hoping for $400 million for Raw, but analysts believe it'll be closer to $387 million per year. For most of the negotiation period, the idea was FX as the leader with Netflix USA, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Amazon Prime all being talked about. Regarding WBD, which would be the game changer in many ways if it happened, the WBD version told to many this past week is that Nick Khan last went to WBD in October with a pitch and was turned down. Lots of different suitors out there. I feel like those are all the suitors we've been talking about the last year on this podcast that we've been discussing TV rights. That window is coming to a close soon, Eric. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see FX as a viable front runner here? Could we see the pivot to streaming? Where's your mind at? You know, I, I really don't have a, a feel. There's there's too much going on in the industry that I'm unaware of and uninvolved in. It's a jump ball for me. Again, it, you'd have to be really inside the executive suite at any one of those opportunities to have a feel or an opinion and clearly i'm not so i i don't know you know the warner brothers discovery thing to me seems like one of the least more interesting opportunities but again i'm not in man i don't know what their plans are what are their goals over the next five years what's their strategy for the next three years i don't know and without some basis of knowledge all we're doing is whiffing, guessing, mm -hmm. and I, I don't like to do that. So I'm, I'm just I'm going to sit back and and watch. I can see benefits from so many different angles for all of the potentials. There's great benefits for all of them, but it all depends on what their strategies and what their goals are for the next three to yeah. five years. So I think there is one, and I'm going to try to be a little analytical here. I think there is one facet at play that has complicated the issue a little bit for raw negotiation rights. 
And that is what's going on with the NBA because the NBA is going to be the premier media property that's going to be hitting the market within the next year. The exclusive negotiating window for Warner Brothers Discovery and ESPN comes to a close at the beginning of 2024. There are expectations that the NBA very well may double their rights agreement, which to put into perspective currently, they get $2.66 billion a year from Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery combined, and they think that they're going to be able to double that. The NBA is one of the most television, most valuable television properties, period, out there. Even more so than NFL? It's right up there. It's right up there with the NFL. Because the NBA has a grasp on young fans in a way that no other sports property does. And, and that entered Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. That's the NFL competing with the NBA. Yeah. That's how they're doing it. Paige Van Zant is a freaking genius. That just answered it all. This show started out speculating as to whether or not this relationship <laughs> between Travis, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift is nothing more than a work, a strategy where everybody wins. How does the end? Well, we know how Travis is winning. <laughs> we know how he's winning, right? That's obvious. What does Taylor Swift get out of this? Mm, perhaps she is nurturing. Ah, I know it. Here's what Taylor Swift's management team is saying. Taylor, you've got a bunch of 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old girls that are the core of your audience. But somebody has to drive them to the event. Their parents have to take them. Fathers take their daughters. Mothers and fathers take their daughters. It's a family event. Why not co-brand? Taylor Swift with the NFL or one of their leading stars to nurture not the current demo, but the parents of the demo that have to buy those expensive tickets. Makes it easier for them. Right? Because Is Taylor's it? kind of a one of us. He's an NFL fan now. There's your answer. Is it He's possible that a genius? Is it possible that she just might be in love with this guy too? Oh. No. <laughs> But anyway, my point here is that Warner Brothers Discovery is going to, in all likelihood, prioritize maintaining some degree of their NBA rights. David Zaslav has said they may move away a little bit from them. You know that NBC Universal is going to be in on those negotiations. They would be crazy not to be. So, in theory, that's probably more at the forefront of their priority list than professional wrestling. And I'm curious, now that USA already has SmackDown locked up, wouldn't they wait to see or try to wait to see where the NBA would go before deciding, oh, we'll take more wrestling on when there's this big valuable sports property out there that would bring in significantly more eyes than wrestling would? Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? On the yeah. surface. Sure. And FX, Disney, yeah, Disney's in on these negotiations. They're going to maintain the NBA with ESPN in some capacity, but they don't have to worry with FX. FX isn't going to be airing sports competition. That is its own entity. And we've also heard that Disney could be offloading FX at some point. So Disney that, could be offloading a lot of stuff. Yeah. Disney's stock price has tanked in the last couple of years because they've gotten so involved in ideology and politics and all of that stuff I don't like talking about. And they're getting their ass kicked as a result. So with all that said, then, it just seems to me like Warner Brothers Discovery especially, but probably USA too, are more or less on the outside looking in here at FX or Amazon Prime as a route for Monday Night Raw. And I do think we'll hear some point in the next month or so where this is headed. And I'm really curious to see what it boils down to. Brian asked Eric, if streaming is the option, why would WWE not stream live on Peacock? Already stream PLE events and have a deal with NBC Universal. Could that work? They could. Uh, absolutely, they could. But think about Amazon. Think about the opportunity beyond 
just the streaming rights that come with Amazon. So much of WWE's revenue is generated by licensing and merchandising. To have Amazon as your partner and, and have access to all of the things that come with Amazon beyond just streaming, I think could be a massive, massive opportunity. It's, it's a also, revenue opportunity. You may not see, you know, I mean, I, you know, in terms of viewership, although, you know, the wrestling audience will follow the product wherever it goes. That's been proven time and time again. Mm -hmm. You know, wrestling better than almost any other form of entertainment can bounce around on a weekly schedule and relatively speaking, be unaffected by it. You take a short term hit when you change nights and things like that, but the audience always finds you. That's the advantage of having <clears throat> such a loyal audience the, the way professional wrestling does and all has always had. It's one of the reasons that Ted Turner used professional wrestling to launch the superstation to help launch the superstation and, and Turner broadcasting. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I think AEW got the opportunity that they got from Turner because people know that the professional wrestling audience will follow you. And they're very, very loyal. Not a lot of programming other than wrestling and sports has that kind of loyal audience following general entertainment, comedy, sitcoms, dramas, whatever procedurals. Yeah, those fans are fickle. They're very fickle. So we'll see. See, I keep saying that. We'll see. I, I know. Wait. It's going to be fun to watch. It is. And look, in a couple of weeks here, we'll be making our 2024 predictions for wrestling like we did last year. And we'll have to revisit our predictions as well to see how things ended up panning out and turning out because it, it has been a pretty wild year in wrestling. And it's been a fun year. It, you know, it, for it shows has. Like, uh, you know, for people like me and, and us and this show and the people that listen to the show that like to learn about the business of the wrestling business and all the machinations behind the scene and everything that happens out except for what happens in the ring, you know, for people that, that are interested in that, this has been a fascinating yeah. year. Well, and there might be something to what Conrad was saying again on raw this past week, they did one of their highest numbers in a long time. 1.884 million viewers. They did 863 in the demo total viewership was up 29%. They were up 34% in the demo, uh, which is pretty significant, all things considered. And that's with the return of CM Punk, the return of Randy Orton. I'm curious How about if they... that? How about the return of... I know we're talking a lot about CM Punk. No, no. Aunt Randy <clears throat> let, his flowers. Let, us not, let us not skip over the return of what I think is one of the He's my favorite performer in the last 30 years is Randy Orton. Randy Orton to me is as fluid and pure of a, a professional wrestler that exists in today's environment or has existed in the past 30 years. Not the biggest, not the most, he's not the rock, not Stone Cold Steve Austin, but in terms of what Randy could do in the ring, phew, he is one gifted son of a bitch. Well, and he doesn't have to do much either, right? He doesn't have to do much. He just knows how to connect with crowds, and they come unglued every time that music hits. He does his pose. He does an RKO. That's all it takes for him. And, and you watch Randy closely. Put him under a microscope and watch him in the ring. He is never not positioned perfectly throughout an entire match. He, his footwork, his timing, his pacing, his ability to control the audience and create the emotions he wants when he wants it. He is, in my opinion, the purest, mm -hmm. purest sports entertainment. He came in personality in 30 years. He came into war games, didn't take a single bump. It was fantastic. He knew exactly what he was doing. That RKO onto J.D. McDonough, where he came off the cage into it, perfectly timed. He is a stellar performer and someone who just connects so well with fans, whether he's a baby face or a heel, he always generates a reaction. And that is one of the true masteries of the art that Randy Orton has down. And I'm with you, man. I always get excited seeing Randy on my TV. He definitely was a big part of this, too, in getting a good rating. 
that's the lapsed fan. We've talked about the lapsed fan on this podcast. Now it's how do you sustain them? Do you actually keep them? Did you do enough to get them to want to tune in next week? That's what we're going to find out and see how they can try to. And better yet, the other part of that comment that you just made, Mm -hmm. did they do enough? And will they do too much too soon? That's the art Mm -hmm. of building story anticipation. That's the anticipation part. And you pointed it out. I didn't see it. Randy Orton didn't take a bump. They didn't give him too much. They didn't have him coming out there, bouncing around like a ping pong ball to prove that he was back and he's 100%. He's going to slowly integrate. And you want to give the audience enough to hook them, but you don't want to give them so much that you've really got nowhere to go because we've seen it all, right? I I think it's going to be a blast to watch just business-wise. It's an exciting time of the year, man. Heading down to Tampa for Royal Rumble season. The Rumble is always one of my favorite events. I'm sure it's one of yours as well. You got the ad-free shows gathering down there and straight into Philadelphia for WrestleMania. It's just crazy that we're already at this part of the year. And uh, I always look forward to it. It's one of the more exciting times in pro wrestling. This has been fun stuff here. Eric, anything else you want to throw out there for our Strictly Business fans this week? Mm, No, man. I think we covered the hell out of it. Oh, how's Ric Flair doing in AEW? That's a A little bit of controversy about that. Honestly, I hardly looked at social media over the last five days. So what, 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 I know there's some controversy. What's it all about? Okay. So I'm, I'm looking up the line so I can read it appropriately and I don't want to attribute anything incorrectly here. So let me, let me just make sure I've got the actual line taken care of, but basically, you know, he's been, he's been paired with uh, sting as sting embarks on this last run that he's doing with aw as he goes to retirement and uh it's it's been controversial to say the least uh but they taped rampage after dynamite this week and he said quote in the promo let's see if it even makes the air because as we tape this rampage has not aired um he invited all the women in the audience from ages 18 to 28 to meet him in his hotel room no boyfriends or husbands which, if you followed Ric Flair's career, that is a line that is very much in tune with the Nature Boy character and stuff that he would have said back been in the for day. the last 30 or 40 years, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think, given some of the controversy that came with bringing him in, that surrounded him just a couple of years ago, it may have triggered some emotions with some people. Is there anything you would like to comment on that at all? Lighten the fuck up, people. Come on, just lighten up. This is professional wrestling, for God's sake. Uh, If that's what this controversy is all about, it's ridiculous. Rick, just go out there and have fun. Don't pay attention. This is the the controversy in in the Twitter universe or the internet wrestling community does not represent the world as we know it. It's a small little cesspool of people that want to bitch and complain and criticize and more importantly, judge. They want to judge you, Rick. They want to be, they want to virtue signal their asses off so they get likes, shares and retweets. Just ignore that shit, Rick. Go out and have fun. You know what to do. This is a great story. Now, it's not without, you know, treacherous points here and there. You know, Rick doesn't, you know, I don't think Rick has any respect for my opinion. But if he did, I would just say limit the amount of physicality because that's not why people are excited to see you. Just be there. Be as good as you can be on the mic, which is better than 90% of the people that are doing it today. But beyond all that, just have fun. And don't listen to the garbage in the internet wrestling community or Twitterverse because it's not real. 
I do want to get one more question here before we wrap up. This is from Anthony from Ad Free Shows. He says, what are your thoughts on WWE going two full months between PLEs? I'm excited for the time to build great stories. So yeah, there's no longer, you know, yeah. for years there used to be a December pay-per-view, but now there's not. It's just Survivor Series to the Royal Rumble, a two-month time period to tell all those stories leading into that. I, I think that's that's another fascinating thing from my perspective because, you know, having those monthly PLEs, they they're, they great, generate great revenue. One of the reasons I went from four pay-per-views to six to eight to 10 to 12 was because WCW needed that revenue at that point in time back in the early 90s, mid 90s. And you kind of become addicted to that, right? That's great cash flow. It's predictable. You know, it's going to be, you're going to get a great return on your investment. That's all the good news. The bad news is it forces you to rush your stories. You don't really have time to let stories sink in, or you have to tell them so quickly that the nuance, some of the subtle aspects of stories that people like to read into and, and speculate about, you don't get to do that because you're, you're speed reading through the book. You don't really get to enjoy the book. You're skimming the surface to get to the next page, or in this case, to get to the next PLE. Now you've got eight weeks to really tell great, nuanced, layered story. And let's see, but I predict that this is going to be a huge, huge improvement in the storytelling structure leading into Rumble, leading into WrestleMania. Yeah, I think there's going to be a stellar, stellar season for wwe they got the elimination chamber event coming from down under as well which is going to be super fun they announced an event for paris this past month it's the international expansion and making these things seem like big time events pacing them out over the course of the year too it's exciting stuff man and makes me anticipate what is to come as a consumer of the product so big shows all around Cannot wait for the Rumble in St. Pete and Tropicana Field. Hopefully the power stays on there. That's a legitimate concern of mine with the Tropicana Field, but we'll see. Uh, we want you to be part of our show here on Strictly Business. Advertise with Eric.com. It's going to get your product out in front of thousands of people every single week on Strictly Business. We got the 83 Weeks feed. It's one of the biggest podcast feeds in the world for professional wrestling, and we want you to be a part of it. Advertise with Eric. Dot com. No better time than the end of the year to start getting that product going, get your business out there. We got the holidays coming up, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate. Always a good time. I like that look on you. That's good. The backwards hat. You're going to be covering yeah. your bald head soon. I know, right? Getting everybody used to it. I got some cowboy hats and stuff later on, too. I start wearing. Okay. I think that's the route. But here's the truth. I look so awesome bald, it doesn't matter. There it is. There's the swagger. This is a fact. There's the confidence. I knew it was there. This has been Strictly Business. We will see you next time.